me at least, uh, at a, a startup that, that was spun out of this work. So it spans from uh, my graduate work to a short postdoc to um, a couple of years at, at a, a small company based in San Diego called Locana. Um, the the uh, latest iteration of this work will be published uh, in a couple a couple of weeks, and and that work will not be described in detail here, but uh, there's plenty to be discussed in, in that lead up um, about the development of this RNA targeting uh, CRISPR platform and also the use of this system in the context of a disease uh, myotonic dystrophy type one. Um, so I studied physics, um, just a quick intro about myself. So I studied physics in Pittsburgh, uh, specifically engineering physics uh, in, from 2005 to 2009. And then a lot of this work that I'll describe here was conducted during my PhD uh, efforts uh, at UCSC in the Yo lab. Um, this was from 2009 to 2016. Um, and I'll just get straight into it. So RNA processing was the uh, motivation for my efforts. So developing means to study RNA processing, manipulate RNA processing. Um, back in 2009, uh, and still to, to a significant degree today, degree today. limited means to uh, address um, RNA processing phenomena, both to study them, but also to reverse them in the context of disease. So I was motivated to develop new approaches that could allow us to alter RNA processing, for instance, to study or manipulate phenomena like RNA splicing, um, RNA turnover, um, and among many other phenomena. Um, RNA processing is really important because it regulates the moment to moment behavior of, uh, of cells. It's, it's the mediator of genetic information and the RNA content of a cell uh, to a significant degree determines what a cell will do at that particular moment. So in 2009, um, a great way to begin any sort of technology development effort is to consider the available uh, technologies and then um, figure out how things can be improved and also just sort of imagine how things might be, um, might look if we were to have an ideal approach and, and uh, aspire to that uh, as much as we can. So uh, RNA processing is, uh, at least at that time, the, the, the best way to, to alter it was to utilize endogenous uh, cell machinery, such as the risk complex, that's the RNA-induced silencing complex, to destroy RNAs within a process called RNA interference. This is a powerful uh, approach to uh, destroying RNAs because you take this um, native machinery, again, the risk complex, and you redirect it to uh, technological applications. Um, the downside here is that the risk complex has uh, native activities. It's involved in all sorts of gene expression regulation. So uh, distracting it from its typical targets can cause problems in the form of misregulated gene expression, which is not ideal. Antigen sense oligonucleotides similarly require uh, cell machinery to destroy RNAs, um, specifically RNAs H, which is an enzyme that's involved in uh, DNA replication. Um, delivery of these uh, molecules is a bit more difficult because they cannot be encoded in DNA. So antisense oligonucleotides are short, chemically modified and, and um, synthetically produced uh, nucleic acids, which again, you need to make uh, you know, in the chemistry lab as opposed to RNA interference systems, which can be encoded in DNA vectors or viral vectors. So, there's a downside there, but um, they're, they're, they're fairly flexible. Both of these approaches are limited to just destruction of RNA, which is, which is not ideal. Uh, ideally, we would have systems that can alter other features of RNA processing, um, for instance, um, splicing or what have you. So um, puff and zinc finger proteins are programmable RNA binding proteins, which were just beginning to be uh, elucidated in the context of technological uh, approaches back then. Um, these proteins are a bit more difficult to work with because they must be reprogrammed for each target, but uh, you can generate hypothetically arbitrary changes to a target RNA. So you could do hypothetically anything you want by fusing different factors, but again, very difficult to work with. So at this time, um, the ideal system that we imagined, at least in, in this recollection, uh, would allow us to generate arbitrary changes to a bound RNA, for instance, like a puff or zinc finger, for instance. Um, the idea is that they must be uh, encodable in a viral vector, so we can utilize um, uh, viral vectors to deliver them maybe in a therapeutic context. And finally, they must be uh, safe with minimal off targets and preferably not immunogenic. So this is our motivation. Um, and as we were, as I was, I was working through um, some ideas in the, in the realm of polymer chemistry, um, the, the era of CRISPR began. So CRISPR-Cas9 is a bacterial uh, immune system 
that allows bacteria to recognize and destroy uh, invading nucleic acids, typically from bacteriophage. And it works by uh, using a nuclease that's guided by an RNA, typically, to a, uh, uh, to a target invading uh, DNA, in, in, in the case of this diagram, at least. Um, so, so Cas9 here in this diagram first recognizes a, can, can, is my, can you see my mouse, by the way? Yes, everything looks good. Please go ahead. Great. Okay. So the uh, PAM motif is recognized by the Cas protein. So this is a short DNA motif, which again, must be recognized for um, interrogation by the guide RNA to occur. And then after that happens, a stable complex among the guide RNA and the, um, I'm sorry, the, the Cas guide RNA and then the DNA tertiary complex can form, um, which is quite tight. And then you can cleave, the system can cleave the target DNA and hopefully interrupt a bacteriophage infection. So the question that we came up with is, can we use the same sort of principle of guide RNA mediated base pairing um, with a Cas protein to target RNA? Um, immediately after that, some work out of the Doudna lab, so Mitch O'Connell, uh, from, and again, in Jennifer Dudman's lab, he was a postdoc there. He's now a uh, faculty at the University of Rochester. They published a paper in Nature describing uh, the use of an oligonucleotide called a PAMR, described here, that can hybridize a target RNA and then uh, create sort of an artificial substrate for recognition by Cas9 um, that uh, can allow you to generate very stable, um, in this case, quaternary complexes between these four molecules. Um, so this was uh, exciting, and we were motivated to uh, figure out how to make this system work in living cells, and then also eventually explore the technological implications of this approach in RNA processing. So my work began um, in this manner with a Cas9 protein, as before, this time nuclease null, so it does not cleave uh, anything, fused to an NLS tag and GFP. So. We place this protein in the nucleus of cells, combine that with a PAMR, and ask the question, if this system is restricted to the nucleus by this NLS nuclear localization signal, can we observe um, uh, uh, guide RNA-dependent export uh, from the nucleus to the cytoplasm as a proxy for RNA recognition? So the idea is if, if, a guide, if, a, if an mRNA that's exported to the cytoplasm is bound by this system, we should see a co-export of, of the uh, Cas9 GFP. So sure enough, um, that is what we observed. We uh, used a guide RNA targeting GAP-DH, this abundant mRNA, and we observed a fairly efficient export to the cytoplasm of this um, complex, indicating that uh, we, we did in fact achieve recognition of RNA in living cells um, in a manner that was largely dependent on the presence of a guide RNA that targets this GAP-DH mRNA. Um, so this was really striking, and this is the moment where I sort of redirected my PhD to chasing this, this CRISPR idea, this RNA targeting CRISPR idea. Um, and we quickly followed up with validation of this uh, approach against uh, FISH. So FISH is, is an established technique for recognition of RNA in living cells and also DNA, um, stands for fluorescence in situ hybridization. So we looked at the distribution, again, of Cas9, fused the GFP, uh, this time targeting beta-actin mRNA, and we compared that to fluorescence in situ hybridization, and we observed fairly uh, tight concordance of these two signal patterns um, as, as measured uh, in these uh, false colored images. If we remove the PAMR that targets this beta-actin mRNA, um, what you see is a sort of a, a, some degree of loss of this co-localization, although it's still there to some degree. Um, and then if you remove the guide RNA, you see almost complete loss of its co-localization as before this, this Cas9 protein is restricted to the nucleus. Um, we compared these distributions um, using this cumulative probability of uh, co-localized signal among these two channels and observed again that the guide RNA and PAMR targeting this beta-actin mRNA uh, promoted the most efficient co-localization of uh, these two signal patterns. So, this indicated to us that the guide RNA is the primary determinant of co-localization, at least in this case, um, but the PAMR did play a role. So the real strength of this platform is the ability to track localization of RNA in living cells. So uh, FISH requires uh, you to kill, permeabilize, fix um, the target cells, and then add these fluorescent oligonucleotides for measurements. 
Um, in contrast, you can just express Cas9 GFP in a living cell and measure RNA localization in that manner. Um, so we did just that, but we did it in the context of oxidative stress. So we applied a compound, sodium arsenite, which promotes the formation of these structures called stress granules, which form in response to various forms of cellular stress, um, typically to sequester non-essential genes so they're not translated so the cell can sort of focus on not dying um, and dealing with the, the stress response. Um, the stress granules are marked with this protein G3BP1, and we observed co-localization of RCAS9 targeting beta-actin mRNA only in the presence of a guide RNA targeting um, beta-actin mRNA. So we saw localization of RCAS9 to these stress granules only when the guide RNA targeting beta-actin was present, um, indicating that we are likely uh, observing this, this uh, trafficking of the ACB uh, mRNA in these living cells. So that was exciting and, and sort of um, an important contribution in terms of RNA imaging um, because it allows untagged tracking of RNA and most other techniques require you to tag an RNA to, to observe its localization. So this was uh, exciting, um, but we were uh, very optimistic about the other applications of this approach in the context of our other RNA processing phenomena. For instance, destroying specific RNAs, changing RNA localization or splicing, um, imaging or assessing RNA levels in living cells, or even destroying cells based on their RNA content via recognition of, um, of target RNAs. Um, so this is something that we reviewed in a bioassays uh, paper in 2015, and we quickly in, in 2017 got to uh, exploration of some of these ideas. Um, so in, we recognize that um, the, a lot of the potential of this approach um, is centered around the, uh, the therapeutic applications of, of the system. So if we can destroy, um, uh, for instance, RNAs that are otherwise intractable using other approaches, we might have a new means to treat human disease. Um, but the, the challenge really was to choose disease targets that made the most sense um, from both a scientific perspective, but also from the perspective of building a startup out of the, the idea. Um, and so I was asked to kind of describe the, the thinking behind the formation of, of, the, of the company Locana um, uh, from, from this basic effort. So I'll, I have a couple slides, and this is one of them that sort of gets into that. The things that we considered um, were the following. Um, for instance, our confidence that the technology was well differentiated from other approaches. Was it truly better than other approaches to treat um, these respective diseases? And very importantly, are there established ways to deliver the therapeutic? Because frequently, um, something that works well in a Petri dish cannot be delivered to the appropriate tissue due to the difficulty of, of getting large biomolecules where you want them to go in the human body. So we, we, wanted, we wanted to sort of answer that question as soon as possible. Um, Having available animal models is extremely important that give you actionable information about the quality of your therapeutic. And also something that I think was really um, surprising early on, but, but turned out to be quite, quite clearly important was the importance of considering um, the uh, clinical endpoints and biomarkers in the context of, of disease choice. Um, so when, the, when a clinical trial is eventually started, it's very important to choose diseases where there are measurable ways to assess the, uh, the, the quality of a therapeutic. Many clinical trials fail because there are limited or ambiguous measurements of the progression or uh, improvement associated with, with the treatment. And uh, so it's extremely important to choose areas where there exist clinical endpoints or spend the time required to come up with new clinical endpoints. I'll talk more about this later, but um, I, think, I think that's enough uh, for now. But we ended up focusing on repeat expansion diseases. Um, this, this is sort of a rationalization, but um, I, I was actually working next to a, a scientist named Ron Batra, who specialized in these diseases. But this, this area turned out to be really perfect union of our technology and an area that really was um, amenable to, to um, you know, therapeutic developments, at least it still appears to be. Um, so repeat expansion diseases are diseases like myotonic dystrophy, Huntington's, ALS, and others that are caused by repetitive DNA tracts that produce frequently repetitive RNAs that cause disease. And for many of the reasons listed here, this turned out to be a great area to apply our technology. For instance, there's many available animal models. Some of the diseases had good clinical endpoints, 
available and uh, uh, competing technologies have largely uh, failed. So that was a great opportunity for us to try to succeed where others, where other clinical trials have not gone so well. So repeat expansion diseases, as I mentioned earlier, are caused by these repetitive DNA tracts that can range from three to six or more nucleotides actually. Um, there's some diseases listed here, but they're all unified by the fact that toxic RNA causes either sequestration of proteins, so their typical activities are not engaged, the production of toxic repetitive proteins like polyglutamine in the case of Huntington's disease, or um, other phenomena related to RNA processing can also go wrong. Um, so myotonic dystrophy is a disease that's caused by this trinucleotide CTG repeats in the three prime untranslated region of DNPK. When transcribed, it generates these repetitive RNAs which bind to a protein called MBNL. MBNL is uh, involved in splicing, uh, alternative splicing of, and also constitutive splicing to some degree of, of many exons. Um, and loss of this protein by association to the repeats causes broad dysfunction in splicing, including the loss of an ion channel, CLCN1, whose loss causes myotonia. So this is sort of an exciting, from, from like a molecular um, pathology perspective, an exciting example where there's a really specific um, splicing dysfunction or molecular events that causes a organismal level um, and, and uh, individual level uh, dysfunction that you can actually really clearly assess uh, in, in a clinical context. The myotonia is, is quite apparent based on the, the, the patient's inability to um, relax certain muscles. So um, this disease is great uh, in that there are many biomarkers. Um, to, to, have, to have this disease is really terrible. The, the, uh, the, the prognosis can range from, um, is typically, typically uh, not good. So we, we're really motivated to, to go after this, this indication. Um, so the first thing that we did was fuse Cas9 again to GFP and assess whether we could measure the localization of these, uh, in this case, CTG repeats. So we looked at um, fish again for CTG repeats and um, the GFP signal again fused to Cas9 and observed very nice co-localization indicating that we are probably targeting these repetitive RNAs. Um, from here, the next question was, could we destroy these repetitive RNAs? So we fused Cas9 to this pin adonuclease described here in red and then targeted these different repetitive RNAs uh, in, in a tissue culture model um, where we overexpress these repetitive RNAs. And we observe uh, very efficient elimination of these repetitive RNAs that cause everything from C9ALS to polyglutamine disease and myotonic dystrophies. So this was really exciting to us. And also sort of, um, we, were, we were struck by why uh, the, the fact that uh, Cas9 GFP also caused a reduction in the levels of these uh, these repetitive RNAs. We'd expect only the nuclease to, to eliminate the repetitive RNA. So we were um, excited to see this result, but also wanted to further investigate why Cas9 GFP also uh, is effective. So we did a couple experiments. First, we took lysate expressing Cas9 GFP, um, and then we also took uh, lysate expressing pin Cas9, mixed these two lysates together, and then measured the degree of RNA cleavage using these radio labeled. Um, short CTG repeat, CUG repeat RNAs, and we observed uh, cleavage only in the presence of pin Cas9. Um, so that told us that this cleavage effect is limited to um, Cas9 pin and maybe some other enzyme in the context of Cas9 GFP uh, experiments was, was generating the RNA elimination. Um, we, we thought maybe there was um, some maybe cellular exonucleases that were involved, so we investigated further by looking at a, uh, this this um, in living cell um, dose comparison of PIN and uh, GFP fused Cas9, and observed that the PIN was much more uh, efficient uh, at cleavage than the uh, GFP fusion at low doses. Um, so this is actually sort of consistent with results um, from elsewhere. So the Thornton lab years ago described an antisense oligonucleotide that does not cleave CTG repeats, uh, but just displaces likely. Um, MBNL and other nuclear localized um, factors from the repeats and causes them to be exported from the nucleus where they're uh, probably just degraded by um, cytoplasmic nucleases. So we expect a similar thing is happening here, the displacement of nuclear factors, the export of these repetitive RNAs and subsequent degradation. 
Another question is whether the system is truly targeting RNA and not DNA. So this is uh, important for uh, to convince ourselves that our system is, is truly repurposed to target RNA, as Cas9 is typically a DNA targeting protein. Um, we wanted to separate the potential of transcription level effects on the reduction in RNA levels. So to do this, we used a vector that has um, a tetracycline responsive element that drives expression of a DMPK transgene that has 960 CTG repeats and GFP. So the idea is we can turn on and off the repeat levels, uh, the repeat transcription via application of this drug, doxycycline. Um, the idea is that we generate expression of the repeats and then we remove doxycycline and then interrupt transcription at our system and then determine in the absence of transcription whether we're losing the presence of these repeats in, in the uh, tissue culture model. Um, so what we observed was that even in the absence of transcription, we still see very efficient elimination of these repetitive RNAs. So here on the left is a quantification of uh, measurements done by qPCR, and we observe a guide RNA dependence loss. So the non-targeting guide RNA doesn't do anything, but the guide RNA targeting CTG pretty efficiently eliminates the repetitive RNAs, again, um, in the absence of transcription. So we were quite motivated. Um, and uh, this was sort of the clincher experiment that really, really convinced me that our system was a truly RNA targeting system uh, that, uh, that targeted these repetitive transcripts. So back to this, um, this slide here. Uh, another question that is very important that I mentioned earlier is delivery. So can the system be packaged in existing gene therapy vectors or other delivery vectors that can get our relatively complex system into living cells? We have a guide RNA, we have a protein. How do we get both those components in cells at sufficient levels to treat disease? Um, so one option is gene therapy, which is where both these uh, materials can be encoded. Um, and a popular gene therapy vector is called uh, AAV, so adeno-associated virus. So adeno-associated virus is great because it's non-immunogenic. It's got um, increasing uh, history of safe use in the clinic, and, um, and, and you can target many tissues with these systems. But the limitation is that you only can fit around 4.5 kilobases of material inside the genome of, of this uh, viral capsid. So that's uh, a pretty tight limitation, especially because the Cas9 pin is uh, already 4.4 kilobases long. So we set out to reduce the size of Cas9, and we eliminated a handful of domains, including um, this H and H domain, and observed even without an H and H domain, our Cas9 pin fusion still very efficiently eliminated the repetitive RNA. So that's indicated here by this delta H and H um, line. So um, this, this, is, this is great because it allowed us to uh, package our system in AAV and, and sort of increases the um, translatable or sort of the, the credibility when it comes to translation of this platform. Another question, um, circling back to something I raised earlier, was whether we reverse the uh, spliceopathy, the splicing dysfunction associated with disease. Um, so myotonic dystrophy is very much a spliceopathy with hundreds of differentially um, uh, included exons. So we looked at myoblasts from a human patient that we differentiated as well into myo tubes in vitro, and we observed whether there was reversal of the dysfunction uh, on the level of splicing. And sure enough, we saw the vast majority of splicing defects reversed, I think more than 93% here in the case of the myo tubes. Um, so this is really promising um, because this disease kind of naturally provides a host of, um, of, of biomarkers and uh, which is great because it sort of gives you a high fidelity measurement of the quality of your approach. And sure enough, it is quite efficient at reversing disease. And then on the right here, we just have a summary of these um, splicing measurements um, where the non-targeting and CTG samples are the uh, samples treated with a non-targeting guide RNA versus a CTG targeting guide RNA. Uh, again, summarized third time here in these uh, scatter plots where you can see the treated tissue converging on the healthy tissue, the disease treated tissue converging on a healthy tissues. So that was really striking to us and um, sort of wrapped up the um, uh, second paper that we published in 2017 um, that Ron and I co-first co authored. Um, so we're really excited about this and wanted to immediately get this system uh, into mice and, and assess whether it's safe and, and functional in the living tissue. Uh, to do this, 
we use the uh, HSA LR mouse model, which expresses in skeletal muscle about 250 CTG repeats. We packaged our system in AAV9 and injected um, uh, contralaterally uh, targeting and non-targeting systems in, in mouse tibialis interior muscles. So it's sort of the, the, the calf muscle of, of the mouse. Um, these muscles are kind of convenient for histology. And we looked at uh, the expression of these uh, repeats in tissue and observed that uh, the system very efficiently eliminated RNA foci associated with disease. So these are the CTG RNA foci. So that was, that was um, promising. Um, we also looked at other uh, features of disease, for instance, the loss of this ion channel, which I mentioned earlier, CLCN1. Again, this is the cause of myotonia, the loss of this ion channel to some degree. Um, we saw a very efficient reconstitution of this ion channel. Um, and we also saw um, redistribution of MBNL protein in a manner that looks um, healthy. So um, here we have a pair of cells next to each other. You can see one of them has RNA foci in it. The adjacent cell has no RNA foci. Um, and the cell with RNA foci, you see this very focal co-localized with the repeats distribution of MBNL protein, indicating that the MBNL protein is still stuck to these repeats. Um, and then uh, we have sort of diffuse pattern in the adjacent cell, which does not have any repeats. So this sort of um, indicates that we're releasing MBNL and um, hopefully reversing splicing. So next we investigated whether splicing reversal occurs. Um, and sure enough, at least uh, about 80, uh, I'm sorry, 86% of um, splicing events were at least partially reversed by our system, as summarized here on the right. Um, and then that data here is, is, is described in a heat map on the left. You can see that the tissues treated with uh, CTG targeting the system um, are similar to these cells uh, the tissue treated with MBNL protein. Um, MBNL protein, again, it's, it's, it's sequestration causes a lot of the splicing dysfunction. So overexpression of MBNL sort of provides a positive control for reversal of splicing dysfunction. And again, we see, uh, we see our, our um, experimental conditions here with the guide RNA sort of converging on this um, positive control. So that was really encouraging. We next assessed um, gene expression changes in this mouse tissue. Um, a hallmark of myotonic dystrophy is lower expression of muscle markers, um, probably due to retarded muscle differentiation and also lots of muscle turnover. So there's a, there are there's more immature muscle present in a piece of tissue. Um, so sure enough, we saw increased expression of many muscle markers uh, in the presence of our system here. Um, we did a gene ontology analysis of the genes that are associated with um, that, that are differentially expressed among the different conditions. And in the targeting versus non-targeting experiments, we saw increased expression of cell adhesion, angiogenesis, and cell matrix, cell matrix adhesion uh, gene groups, uh, indicating that overall muscle health was improving. Um, it's known that these three areas are typically dysfunctional in the context of this disease. So to see um, differential um, the ZGO terms pop up in this respect was encouraging that we are improving muscle health. So here you can see that immune system processes um, appear to be coming up as a GO term when you compare mice treated with mouse MBNL versus our system. So we wanted to investigate whether there was any sort of destructive or broad ranging immune response. So we looked at um, expression of various uh, genes associated with immune response. And we observed uh, no striking differences. One of the mice appears to have um, modestly upregulated genes associated with the immune response, specifically adaptive immune response. But, um, but there's not any really clear trends here. This is something that we investigate further that um, will be the subject of, of work that will be published shortly. So that's, that's it for the scientific portion of this. I have uh, a couple of slides at the end of this. I was asked to sort of discuss the, the path to um, from academic science to, to a startup. And um, I, I'd be happy to get into some of that. Um, I guess we can save all the questions for the end, both science and, um, and, and about this. Um, so uh, I use my PhD sort of as an opportunity to uh, test ideas and uh, in, in service of eventually um, uh, spinning off a technology. Um, and I think 
we're all here because we, we believe that biology is, is you know, the field to be in and sort of analogous to physics during the nuclear age and space race in um, the 1940s and 1970s. There was really broad support in society um, for the uh, for, for, the, for the, both the training, but also the um, employment of people in, in physics and sort of biology is coming to that point where there's both industrial and academic and private support for, um, for doing biology. And that means that biology can be done in, in a wider range of um, environments than before. Um, and and uh, one of those environments is, is naturally the world of, of industry. Um, so the, uh, I, th I think the, so, so, so over the course of my PhD is something that I really spent a lot of time thinking about was this idea of tiered technology development. So, um, so short of solving a big problem, we could, it's very, it's, it's, it's sort of easy to identify, you know, big intractable problems. Um, the difficult thing is as a PhD student, um, when, when you have just your two hands and, and some support, in that, uh, to identify problems that, um, will generate publishable units along the way to the big idea. Um, and so the case of this um, imaging to therapeutic approach, that's, that's precisely what happened. And I think it's really easy to rationalize things in hindsight, but um, it, it definitely helped to have um, sort of this tiered approach where we have a publishable unit in the form of RNA imaging. And then from there, another unit that in, in the form of the, you know, what the, the bigger problem of, of human disease. Um, they're both big problems, but I was more excited about the kind of the therapeutic implications of the system. Um, so I think that's a useful kind of general principle, especially when you're students trying to, to get work done in terms of published efforts, but also try to make stuff that could be spun off into, into a company. Um, I think that's the most important thing here. Um, I, I'll just put this slide up one more time because this is a really useful um, description of how to sort of be ruthless about therapeutic developments um, and, and building therapeutic technologies. Um, there are uh, lots of factors that determine whether a viable business can be built around a technology that's focused on treating a specific disease. And any of these factors can really um, get in the way in a profound fashion early on. And, and, and for that reason, it's important to think about this stuff early. Um, I sort of got lucky by coming across Ron Batra um, his skills in disease biology and my technological skills sort of dovetailed really naturally to end up in a disease area that um, fulfilled many of these requirements. So I was very lucky in that respect. Um, but when it came down to choosing specific indications to go after, um, this type of thinking, I think, can be really instructive and really the earlier that it's conducted, the better. And finally, um, I can, I'll just discuss a couple sort of, sort of obvious uh, distinctions between academia and startups, uh, and uh, just maybe just for the sake of um, conversation after this, but um, in general, I think the most interesting distinctions here are kind of the basic motivation, um, and really in the end, uh, any sort of under the basic understanding of the world that could have implications is appreciated um, in, in the academic world, whereas in startups, it's really about solving problems for people who can pay for solutions, which is in some ways narrower, but in biology, there are many unsolved problems. So it's not necessarily a major limiting factor. Um, I think one, another exciting thing about startups is that they're extremely flexible in terms of the social contracts and organizational structure um, that allows you to sort of change systems and structures uh, on the fly in order to best address problems. Um, and on the academic side, there's, there's a, a really, really nice uh, kind of, uh, framework in which to imagine and, and, and to build organizations, but um, it is, is very much similar at different institutions and, and not, not super flexible, which, um, which is something that can make it difficult to kind of address, you know, uh, address uh, systems on the fly to, uh, to deal with different problems. Um, and then finally, um, there are, there's a really a, a wide range of um, support out there for, um, for startups everything from professional investors to private foundations, and individuals with, a, with an interest. And that can make, um, make sort of creative funding schemes more possible than, um, than elsewhere, although that's, again, a generalization, which is not necessarily universal. Um, so, the, so that's it for this presentation. I'd like to thank 
uh, Ron Batra, my uh, close collaborator and colleague as well at Wakana Incorporated. Um, uh, I'd like to thank Gene Yeo, my co-founder and, and mentor um, during my PhD. And then um, the uh, Yeo Labras who were part of this, there was a bunch of them. Uh, Mari Swanson at the University of Florida and his student, James Thomas. Jennifer Doudna at, at Berkeley and, and her former postdoc, Mitch O'Connell, who's now at University of Rochester. They were, um, they were instrumental at the beginning of this work. And then um, uh, Guangbing Zia and Kevin Corbett at Florida at UCSD respectively were involved in uh, that, that second paper focused on myotonic dystrophy, uh, the, the molecular side of it. So that was really, really a pleasure to work with them. And I'd like to thank Mr. Ahuja for the invitation. Um, it's really a pleasure to speak to you all, hopefully under better circumstances soon. Um, the, uh, I'd like to thank Leo Karian as well. I'm actually doing a sabbatical in his lab right now. Um, it's been really great. Uh, it's been a great environment here in Cologne. And um, I'm really appreciative of the opportunity. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dave, for a stellar talk. And now I think we can open it for the questions for others. So guys, I mean, we can start the question session. In case you have questions, please ask. Um, so Dr. Davis, David. Hi. Uh, so I'm Omkar, one of the PhD students in the department. So uh, it was insightful talk. So are there been any de developments towards targeting multiple RNA targets like using CRISPR-Cas9? Has there yes. been any work on that line? M uh, multiple RNA targets simultaneously, for instance? Yes. Yeah, it's... because in cancer condition, it is multifactorial. Has there been any such work? Yes, um, there, so Cas9 could hypothetically be used that way. Um, there's another system that was published um, more recently about a year, two years ago, um, called Cas13D. There's many different uh, orthologs of Cas13D, but this and, and some other um, native RNA targeting Cas protein. So they, they typically target RNA. They weren't repurposed to target RNA like Cas9. Um, they uh, have this guide processing activity, so you can actually deliver an array of guides that are processed into individual um, into individual guides, and you can you can have them target uh, probably up to tens of um, uh, targets simultaneously. Def definitely a few targets. So designing these arrays, um, there's a couple of papers more recently that describe describing uh, really large arrays um, with different Cas proteins, but it's definitely possible to target at least a handful of um, transcripts simultaneously using these type of guide RRAs and uh, Cas13D. So the possibility of uh, developing a personalized gene therapy for cancer is uh, is open, right? Yeah, uh, sure. I mean, um, it's a difficult problem and, and delivery is always a challenge, um, especially in, in, in the area of cancer, but um, absolutely, that's an exciting area. Um, so, what what would you think the impact of combining uh, two other uh, therapies? Like uh, over here, uh, in this what you showed, you, you are targeting RNAs. How about also combining targeting DNA as well? Simultaneous, sure, yes, yeah, simultaneous targeting of DNA and RNA, definitely, definitely plausible. Um, I guess there's some situations where yeah. that could be useful. Um, and yeah, if you wanted to, for instance, alter, um, uh, like to turn some genes on, so increase the expression of some genes and downregulate others, that's something you could do with like uh, CRISPR I or CRISPR A targeting DNA, uh, and then you could downregulate genes using an RNA targeting system. So yeah, that that type of um, yeah, that type of flexibility is there. Also, in your current work, uh, um, what is the uh status of any any possibility of clinical trial so uh yeah locana i i am no longer with locana but that's um typically the goal of um companies of that sort to uh, take this this therapeutic technology and, and reduce it into a a, a clinical product and uh, that's that's the goal yeah okay thank you that would be all uh, Thank you. 
फिर उस पर वर्ड प्रेस में तो बहुत बहुत ईजी है बना आई थिंक देर इज समर क्वेश्चन गाइज Uh, hello hi this is chitrita i am a phd student too so my question is when you uh, do the uh, modification of the rna how do you account for the effect of the post transcriptional effects of that modification that can have the effects of the the cleavage of an rna using using the crispr system yeah yes yes um so the i guess the effect that we're looking for is reduction of rna levels post transcriptionally so so that's yeah that's precisely what we're looking for maybe i didn't understand the question i'm sorry so my question was uh, when uh, if that uh, gene is a uh, say a transcription factor or motive so post transcriptionally modifying that what effect can it have on our system It's targeting a transcription factor, for instance, on the level of RNA. I think, uh, Dave. I think uh, let me bring, let me pitch in to clarify what Chitrita was saying. No, if yeah. I start correct. There's a lot of compromise. Yeah. So I think she wants to know, like, since you have used endonucleases to really cleave off the RNA transcripts, if I understood correctly. So she said, like, sometimes the RNA is also undergo modifications, like RNA editing, like you know, A to I conversions or methylations or something. So does it has impact on the cleavage on the target RNA? Oh, um, I would imagine yes. Um, not something we've investigated, but um, the it, it is a base sort of a base pairing mediated interaction. I mean, it, it is a uh, the, the guide RNA is the main mediator of the the recognition by the Cas protein. Um, so I imagine, for instance, an eight I edit would would it, would would affect the the recognition. Um, not something we've investigated, but very plausible yes any other question guys because i have couple of them mm -hmm. i will ask in yeah, that i i i have a very nice question dev and uh, you know uh, i'm a computational biologist i don't understand crispr at all uh, but it was such a wonderful talk and so much of work went into uh, you know making this thing happen so i was trying to understand that what is the rationale of you know which diseases are curable by uh, this uh, you know rna targeting crispr i mean what is the rational of you know or or which diseases hypothetically can be treated by uh, this kind of things and which cannot be treated because the problem is when you fix the rna right i mean does it guarantee that it is not going to come back or you know in the subsequent progenies of the cells right so how how does it i mean or or somebody it has to be done uh, frequently to keep the disease in control right so i'm just trying to understand a very broad picture of uh, you know how how this treatment uh, can uh, you know lead to uh, uh, remission right that's definitely something that's been on our minds um whether we can get long term treatments whether If we treat tissue, will um, the, will the therapy be lost, and then the uh, disease-causing transcripts just be produced, um, you know, later, and, and the disease will come back. Um, so that is related to our choice of delivery vector. So AAV, uh, there's evidence in in large animal models, and as, as well as it's actually growing evidence in human beings, that you can get long-term expression of therapeutic genes, um, and I, I mean for many years after administration with a single dose. um so that way the system is being continuously produced um in living tissue and um in that manner uh, we should be able to get a uh, long term treatment of disease um the way this works is the aev generates these little uh dna loops called episomes that uh hang out in nuclei for for long periods they're 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 fairly stable um after after it's just a single dose for instance of of the aev therapeutic so um the general metrics for choosing a disease are there has to be the simplest way to think about it is okay there needs to be a way to get long term expression of our system because we we're targeting rna and the disease has to be addressable on the level of rna those are sort of the two kind of broadest ways to to choose indications that are you know useful here
Okay, thanks, thanks for the answer and good to know about the promises. Uh, at the same time, my other question is, uh, what kind of, I think you discussed it, uh, you know, uh, you know, at, at some point uh, during your talk, but which uh, uh, modifications at the RNA level are treatable by, like there are several post-transcriptional modifications one can think of, right? So, yeah. And, and different diseases have different implications in terms of uh, different kinds of post-transcription. So which are the uh, ones which can be treated using this kind of uh, mechanisms? Like the splicings and the RNA editing or everything, it doesn't really matter. So the system we described here um, is, is an RNA cleaving system. So naturally just situations where you want to destroy RNA are, um, are, are tractable. Um, there's been some work published recently involving splicing factors, involving Cas13 proteins by other groups. Um, I forgot the name, I should, I should remember the authors, but there's some really neat work involving um, modulation of splicing. There's work out there involving modulate, uh, introducing RNA edits by fusing Cas proteins to ADAR from a, from a bunch of labs. Um, there's, yeah, they're, they're really any RNA modifying factor, um, well, not any, many, many RNA modifying factors have been fused in RNA targeting cast proteins um, and published, not, not by um, my collaborators necessarily, but, um, but uh, by other groups. So there's a lot of work out there covering all these things. And uh, I could, I could, that's, that's really like a whole other uh, expert. Well, there's a lot going on there. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of other short questions again. I think, you know, since a lot of us are from computational background, in fact, there are a lot of students who are participating in this who come from a very different background, although they are learning biology. So, can you highlight some of the computational challenges that you had to overcome uh, in order to make this happen? Um, that would be wonderful. Uh, for the most part, um, we sort of just used off-the-shelf computational tools. Um, we did a lot of RNA sequencing and um, just used off-the-shelf differential expression and, and splicing packages. Um, this, this work was conducted by Ron, um, the actual computational efforts. So um, he, he, you know, to my knowledge, it was all just off-the-shelf software. Um, there's been some neat work by other labs recently describing um, computational tools to predict uh, target sites for cast proteins uh, on RNA. Um, so uh, both just um, using machine learning with, with uh, you know, medium-sized data sets to predict good target sites. Um, and, and so that work, not conducted by us, but very relevant to this, to this area. Um, but long story short, we did not develop any new tools here, but there is a need for tools to predict the behavior, for instance, target sites of of uh, cast proteins that, that work in RNA. And, and, and that could, in principle, be a new area when it comes to RNA, uh, right? I mean, as compared to DNA. Uh, I'm, I'm mean, sorry. Target site prediction. So, so predicting target site, uh, that problem could be slightly different uh, for RNA as opposed to DNA right? Yeah, the basic principles seem to be quite different. Um, there's no requirement for a PAM. For many RNA targeting cast proteins, there is uh, something called a PFS, which is a protospace mm -hmm. flanking sequence. Naturally, there's no PAM on RNA, um, but there is some preference for adjacent sequences. Although most of the popular, yeah, yeah most of the popular um, RNA targeting cast proteins don't have really strong um, preferences in that respect. Anyway, there, yeah, it's very different principles that appear to read to, um, got to, it, yeah, mm -hmm. determine good guides for targeting RNA. Thank you. I'm done with that. Uh, Gaurav? Uh, any other question, guys? I mean, that's for you, students. I mean, you can ask questions. Feel free to ask questions. Any other question? Okay. If not, uh, Dave, I have only two questions, quick ones, because I know about all this. Sorry. So my question is like, I mean, you have shown like by using this RNA CRISPR, you can dissolve this RNA foci. And how this RNA foci are different from the stress granules, which is always like RNA plus protein complexes, which you showed with arsenide treatment, you know, in the cytosol. So my question is, is it there is enough space within these granules so that the complementary guide RNA can bind and the CRISPR can sit and 
chopped off or the rna foci are comparatively more loose so that the complementation can happen and uh, so it can be done so i can only speculate here um well first of all the uh, it's an interesting question the um in the case of stress granules we we applied the system before the stress granules formed so the association of our system should occur before the condensation of these granules and these granules have they are phase separated and they do have very different biophysical properties at their cores and they do at their surfaces or, or in the free cytoplasm. So um, I've not investigated whether you can access a stress granules RNA, but I imagine it might be different than doing it in a cytoplasm. Um, in the case of RNA foci, they, they uh, are, as far as I understand, not phase separated so that there's not a particularly different um, biophysical environment around these stress granules, I'm sorry, around these RNA foci. Um, and that's, there's some evidence to that, at least our ability to access them, um, in, in both human cell lines that have pre-existing RNA foci and in that experiment that I showed you earlier with the tetracycline response to the element, the foci were, were present before application of the system. And then we saw very efficient elimination of the foci within a day or so, maybe, maybe sooner. So that indicates to me that there's enough, um, exchange with, with, um, Free solution um, of you know of, of these of these RNA foci, such that uh, our system can access the, these these um, these these RNA foci. So, um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, sorry. Please continue. Uh, I, I think that's actually that's actually pretty much it. So I, I think the kind of the stress granules are more condensed and phase separated in the foci. Um, I'm actually not really up on foci biophysics, but I'm, I'm guessing based on our results, that's uh, Got it. So, more available. So, so yeah. in your in vivo, so my last question is in your in vivo experiments, so you have used this AAV virus system and then you basically uh, did the injection intra peritoneal, no, not peritoneal, intravenous from the vein, from the tail, if I see correctly, no? Intravenous injection. Uh, in the data I showed you, we uh, injected to the tip, uh, intramuscularly, actually, the TPL. Uh, it's intramuscular. So, so how much is the efficiency in vivo you have got? Like, so it, it's basically systemic. Like the virus would have gone into every organ somehow. It was not targeted, or was it targeted AAV? Uh, AAV nine pretty efficiently um, enters muscle tissue, but it also sort of sticks to muscle tissue. Um, maybe it sticks to the ECM. Maybe maybe it just gets taken up efficiently enough. Anyway, the point is, it doesn't really leave the 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 the, the muscle where it's injected, um, for the most part, at least in the experiments we did. So we only saw significant uptake in the muscle, um, and within the muscle, we saw, you know, depending on the quality of the experiment, anywhere from like half to like most of the muscle was um, was was treated based on uh, either looking at the number of like the cells with foci or by looking at the um, direct expression of our system. So. Um, within the muscle, we saw most of the muscle treated in, in, in our experiments. Great, great. So, guys, any other question? Anyone? So, if not, Dave, thank you very much. I mean, it was good to see you again after so long, and I hope to see you again soon as well. So, thanks yeah. a lot from the from the behalf of the, our department. I would like to thank you again for giving us this stellar talk, and thank you very much, Dave. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me. And thanks for all the great questions. Thank you. So guys, I think we should end up. Thanks, Dave. I will contact you. Thanks. Thank you. So guys, we can disperse. Thanks a lot.